Have you ever been asked a question before, and someone demanded that you answer yes or no, but you weren't comfortable with the potential results of either answer? Yes or no, it's one or the other. Well, today, I'm going to prove them wrong for you. Yeah, in case you guys don't remember, that was my uh, old outro. <laughs> There's something in math called classical logic, or more formally, propositional calculus, where statements get true or false values assigned to them. So imagine a situation with a village of people. If you know that there are five villagers there, then the statement, there is at least one villager in this village, is true. We can use the statement, each villager has one piece of paper, and combine with our previous statement to show we have at least one piece of paper. That's essentially how our logic system works. Now let's apply this to a few more situations. Let's say that you have Alice and Bob in a village. Alice has a list with Bob's name on it, and Bob has a list with both Alice and Bob's name on it. Then walks in Ken. Ken needs to have a list of everyone who has themselves on their own list. Go ahead and pause the video here, and try to figure out who's on Ken's list. Who did you put on Ken's list? Did your list only contain Bob? If so, you got it correct. If not, well, you may have still gotten it right. Yes, if your list says Bob and Ken and nothing else, then you are also right. In both cases, Ken has a list of everyone who has themselves on their own list. One way we can check this is by using our logic. Go through each person and verify true or false as to whether they should be on the list. It turns out that both are correct when you ask this question for Ken. Now let's try another. Let's pretend that Ken in fact wrote his own name on his list for this situation, but we'll add a fourth person who shows up. His name is Joe. Now, Joe doesn't like Ken. He's, uh, <laughs> he has issues with him, and he wants to actually do the opposite of Ken and have a list of everyone who does not have themselves on their own list. Go ahead and try to figure out who is on Joe's list. If you figured out a valid list for Joe, go ahead and pause to double check your answer. Otherwise, just keep watching. Did you figure it out? I'm sure that you may have had some issues and I may need you to forgive me because I might just ask some impossible questions in my video sometimes. It's easy to figure out who belongs on Joe's list except for Joe himself. Does Joe go on his list or not? Yes or no? I demand an answer. If Joe is on his list, then he has someone on his list who doesn't fit his criterion. However, if Joe is not on his list, then he's missing someone who fits his criterion. So what is going on here? Is this impossible? What does this mean about yes or no questions? What, what went wrong? It turns out that among its strengths, classical logic also has weaknesses. The one I am telling you about right now is famously known as Russell's Paradox. And depending on how propositions are defined in your logic system, it can show up. For example, when calculating the value of a statement like, does Joe have Joe on his list, we can get a contradiction. What do you think we can do to prevent contradictions like this from occurring? Let's pause to give you a chance to think of an answer. Turns out that there's a way to deal with this type of contradiction, and it's to restrict how we apply our logic system in a way that will be sensible and not allow contradictions. So there's only one rule we have to follow, and that is we have to prove that our propositions exist. Our two statements that we thought were valid propositions, Joe must be on the list, and Joe cannot be on the list, 
contradict each other, but we can correct for our mistake of the application of our logic system and just accept the fact that Joe's list cannot exist. Now, we can add that to our statements and it turns out that they don't contradict each other because Joe's list can exist in the first place. So how is this useful? Well, type theory and programming. Intuitionistic logic is a restricted classical logic that takes anything in our proposition and we have to prove that it exists. For example, Ken's list. So if we say Ken's list exists and we say Ken's list has Bob's name on it, we can combine the two propositions together to get a new proposition that says Ken's list, which definitely exists, has Bob's name on it. That solves our problem with Joe's list because Joe's list doesn't exist. Let's look at Bob's list for a simpler example. We'll say the proposition Bob's list exists is proposition P. Well, if that's true, then we can ask the proposition Q, does it have Alice on it? And we can answer true or false. But if it doesn't, well, we don't have an answer. So it, all three cases have a result. Either we have a defined answer, which is true or false, or Bob's list doesn't exist, and we don't have a, a proposition Q with an answer at all. Because it depends on Bob's list existing. Programming languages use this fact to allow you to construct very large expressions knowing that they can always reduce to a valid type. Let me show you an example. If we construct a sum of a product of two numbers with a number, then our result, or the value of our expression, can be found simply by computing a product then a sum, both of which are done in a finite amount of time. Therefore, we have a proof that this expression has a value, which is actually really important to know. You could apply this to more complex functions. Perhaps you have a function that should return the last digit of pi if it were to exist, or maybe one that we don't know if it will finish computing, like the first collapse integer, which doesn't reduce to 1. Well, this might not initially sound like a common case, but consider a very abstract complex software program combining billions of algorithms together. Assume each algorithm magically somehow has 1% chance of not computing. You would only need to depend on 23 algorithms before your master algorithm has less than an 80% chance of computing successfully. Now imagine if that was a C program that was used to control your fighter jet mechanisms. Thanks for watching guys, shout out to iCAD Animations. If you guys like to subscribe and like my videos, uh, you might be interested in donating to my Patreon, which I'll use that initial $100 to start work on the presumptuous Monty Hall problem and some assumptions that some professors make when trying to explain it. And like I do in all my videos, I'll try to connect it to type theory and programming languages and good software development at least most of my videos. A random fact about me, before my internship ended at a company, an MIT professor working there said that he didn't think I was a good software developer. But he also said that math doesn't make you a lot of money, but uh, look up the PageRank algorithm for Google. <laughs> Guys, I'm here to apply what I know, and if I'm right, then I actually am a good enough foundational mathematician, abstractionist, and innovator to change how the world codes. So if you're an open source developer, help me prove him and so many others wrong for the right reasons by creating a new development environment based on the Coke logic system. See you guys later.